from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow, 30 minutes away from the start of trading, and we can see markets searching for direction amid a confluence of data showing inflation slows, and yet so does growth. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, fresh economic data strengthening the case for a pause. Secretary Yellen doubling down on her default warnings as the regional banks take another leg get lower. We begin with the big issue nearing the end of the global rate hiking cycle. Inflation is the big problem. All of these central banks have shifted to focusing only on mm -hmm. concurrent data. Inflation, 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 that's what matters. At some point, they need to make the shift because they're waiting for these lags and it doesn't work. They're now moving towards a pause. They could pause here. I do think we're in pause territory. It's definitely optimistic to think about a rate cut, not so optimistic to think about a rate pause. They're seeing some cooling in the data. We think rates are restrictive enough. We want to wait for those long and variable legs. This has been, in reality, a very slow moving economic cycle. Have central banks tightened enough? Have they tightened too much? It's a fairly nuanced um, position at the moment. Pause and let's wait. I don't know how much of a difference 25 basis points makes at this point. The devil will be in the details. Joining us now to discuss is PGM's Lindsay Rosner and Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites. Lindsay, I want to start with you. You know, honestly, we've been getting all of these data points, and today PPI dropping the most since 2021, but jobless claims rising to the highest level since 2021. Is this accelerating the downturn that so many people have been talking about? I think the, the big takeaway is the data points we had prior to today. Um, there was nothing that we could see, I think, in PPI today that would change the story. And in fact, that number was bang on. If we were worried about core goods and inflation, PPI is something we care about. We're not worried about core goods. We've had the information we, we needed to see to have the Fed pause, to not hike anymore. And our thesis that they'll cut at the end of the year, despite what we just saw in claims, holds. Zach, is your, is your opinion the same, that basically what we're seeing is a disinflation that gives the Fed some breathing room that really does point to slowing growth, just like so many people said? No, Lisa, I'd actually take the other side of that. Looking at the CPI data released yesterday, I'm a little bit concerned about the trend in core goods that we thought was very encouraging in Q4. It's really reversed, and you're seeing core services start to come down, but the core goods side of the equation come up. So that's something that we're a little concerned about when it comes to considering how sticky inflation can be with the policy rate where it is in the tight labor market that we have. I think today's PPI data and the jobless claims is encouraging in the softening of the labor market and bringing, bringing inflation down at least a little bit. But looking at CPI, we're, we're a bit concerned about that good side of the equation. Zach, you weren't alone. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin reacted to just that data, telling the Associated Press, quote, I'm still open to the notion that demand is settling and inflation will follow in relatively short order, but I wouldn't say I'm convinced yet. Inflation is still sovereignly high. Lindsay, how would you respond to that, given that you are seeing some sort of disinflation and yet even Fed officials are saying it's just not comforting? Yeah, look, they're looking for 2%. We don't see 2% yet, so I think that statement isn't incongruent with what we believe. But I think it's clear that inflation is rolling over. PPI is a leader to CPI. PPI peaked in March. CPI peaked in September. This is all working in the right direction. Maybe the speed of travel isn't as great as, as the most optimistic would want, but it is definitely moving in the right direction. There have been a ton of hikes put into the system. I, I think we're definitely warranting a place where we pause. And again, towards the end of the year, I think we cut. I mean, what we're seeing with the volatility that continues in regional banks this morning, there are issues in the market. And I don't think we can just be blindly focused at inflation and its stickiness. We're going to get to the banks in just a minute, but just in general with this trend of disinflation but also growth slowing, there's a question of what it means for risk assets. UBS's Mark Heffley is saying investors may be getting ahead of themselves, writing, quote, while inflation is trending in the right direction, we still see potential for disappointment among equity investors on the pace of Fed easing in the remainder of this year. Lindsay, would you be cautious in equities? I would. Um, as you know, I'm biased. I'm a fixed income person, although I started in convertible bonds, which is a little bit of both. 
But I think the equity market is missing a lot of what's going on here. I mean, the VIX in, in high, you know, high teens just seems to be telling a completely different story than the fixed income market. And I think the fixed income market's got it right. Um, there are definitely some concerns about what this means for corporations going forward. Uh, we've seen earnings. They are not as bad, but the number is still negative in terms of, of earnings quarter over quarter. So that's important to, to keep in mind. And equities just seems to be completely looking through it. Zachary, I'm curious your, your vantage point, especially from the credit side of things, given that a lot of what we're seeing is actually pretty good for credit, that you have a sort of stabilization with respect to inflation, but you still see some growth. How do you push back against some of the pessimism out there in credit land where people are saying, just wait, just wait, just wait? Do you or do you embrace it and say, yeah, things are going to get ugly? We don't think things are getting ugly yet, Lisa. And when I think about the current environment, I kind of think Kerry is king. There's a lot of yield out there. We're not expecting a recession this year. We think the Fed's on pause. And if we can get a little bit of stability from the rate side of things, from a monetary policy perspective, if we can get a little bit of clarity on the regional banks, our view is that the concerns there are overblown. We think things are going to be a, a pretty solid backdrop for credit. I, I do agree that the equities seem a little bit buoyant and have been less concerned in aggregate with respect to regional banks, some of the volatility around the debt ceiling. But from a credit perspective, we think things look pretty good and we're staying overweight, both high yield and investment grade, looking through to the end of the year. Meanwhile, we are getting a slew of data from the United States, the latest being PPI, which does signal inflation is cooling. Jobless claims also climbing to the highest level since 2021. All of this giving people uh, some confidence about a Fed pause. Bloomberg's Michael McKee joining us now. Mike. Well, Asa, I think you got to take jobless claims with a little bit of the old two-handed economist uh, thing because a lot of economists are saying the big jump we saw to 264,000, a 24,000 jump in one week, is largely due to seasonal factors. Maybe we'll see if that uh, continues, if it goes down in coming weeks, but we certainly have had a lot of layoff notices that should start to show up in the data. And the rise is suggesting that maybe we're seeing a weaker labor market, and that is is going to uh, feed into the market perception of the Fed being done, if not cutting. Uh, PPI does the same thing. It comes in at a very low level on a month-over-month -month basis. Not the negative numbers we saw last month, but uh, at least a low level. And on a year-over-year -year basis, the headline 2.3, and for the core 3.2, both of those the lowest, as you mentioned, Lisa, for uh, some time. Uh, PPI core X trade. 3.4%. Uh, that uh, shows you that margins are starting to compress as well. And people talking about, are we seeing disinflation? Tom asked me that in surveillance. I said, yes, uh, John Riding pushed back. But if you look at these numbers, it does suggest that we are seeing the Fed with success. We're not there yet, but almost all of the inflation indicators are trending down, and Lisa, I'd point to the white line down there. That's the Atlanta Fed. They do a survey of business leaders and what they think pr prices are going to be. So along with the producer price index, you can see that they think prices are coming down, the business price index from the Atlanta Fed. And that would also feed into this growing narrative that the Fed is at least done. Mike, wonderful. Thank you so much, as always. Lindsay, I just want to pick up on what you were talking about, and frankly, Zachary is overweight in credit land. Do you agree with that? Do you think that credit can withstand uh, some of the turmoil that you're expecting in stocks, despite concerns about growth? I think there are a few things that Zach said that I agree with, and, and maybe a few that I disagree with, uh, which makes the conversation fun, right? So in terms of Kerry being king, I totally agree with that one. We have great opportunity for carry, yield spread, however you want to call it, um, in the investment grade market. High yield, um, we're kind of at average levels there, but still there is some to be had and overlay active management and that works well. But I think something interesting, Zach's pointing out that he thinks that inflation is actually quite sticky and quite concerning, dot, 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 probably means that the Fed would have to be more aggressive. Um, that's actually not where we stand. We think that the Fed is, is going to actually cut because we think there's a decent likelihood of recession. Um, that actually makes us feel like credit right now, it's, it's about having the, the right spots, picking the right names. And it isn't just, let's just be overweight investment grade, let's be overweight high yield because the market from an economic perspective 
is in a good spot. We have some concerns about that economic macro backdrop, and that goes back to finding the right names where there is good carrying yields, but that you actually really believe in the balance sheet. Zachary, your response to the idea of rate cuts by later this year? We're not calling for rate cuts because we think inflation, while it is coming down, I agree. I think the trends that we're seeing on the core goods side, like I mentioned, are concerning. But we think economic growth is going to remain positive. And so when you think about the Fed's reaction function in the past, they've been able to respond to volatility or slowing in economic growth very quickly with rate cuts in the past because we had inflation at one and a half to two percent. We're still around five percent on many measures of inflation, whether you're looking at year over year core prices, looking at a three-month annualized measure. And so we, we are a little bit concerned on the inflation side. We think the Fed's on pause for now, but we're not calling for a rate cut. At the end of this year, we think that could come into the equation in 2024. Right now, we are seeing the S&P at session lows down three-tenths of a percent as, I guess, bad news is bad news, the idea of an economy weakening. What's interesting is the divergence between the U.S. and what's going on overseas. Earlier this morning, we got the Bank of England coming out, upgrading their projection. You hear a lot of hawkish proclamations from the ECB. Lindsay, from your vantage point, do you see this bifurcation opening up right now between the U.S., U.K., and the rest of Europe in the sense that they are just far behind in fighting inflation but also have a stronger economy at this point relative to the U.S. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, when we've looked out at, uh, on the investment landscape and, and where we want to invest this year, our focus has absolutely been in the U.S. I mean, the reasons of high inflation in the U.S. are very different than what you see in the U.K. and Europe. So that kind of started things for us about looking differently. Um, and sure enough, you see, in the U.S., we're probably likely to pause. And to your point, there was a 25 basis point hike this morning. If you look at inflation expectations in the U.S. as well, a year out, and this is really amazing, it's happened in, in pretty much the past two months since the beginning of the banking flare, um, we have seen inflation expectations drop about 100, uh, 100 basis points for the next year. So there is just a very different market dynamic different economic backdrop. And so when it comes to where we want to invest from a credit perspective, really finding the most opportunities in the U.S. because of everything you mentioned. Zachary, final word. We're also more focused in the U.S. We've had a market perform rating on European credit. And so we think that while economic growth has been resilient so far, we think when it comes to the winter concerns around energy prices flaring back up, we think those economies are a little bit more vulnerable to that. And so we like staying focused in the U.S. on a relative value perspective. Lindsay Rosner, Zachary Griffiths, both of you are sticking with us and just staying on the central banking theme and the cross currents. Uh, Neil Kashkari was a dove, then a hawk, now maybe getting a little more dovish, saying that wage growth has softened somewhat, even though the job market is strong, and then also saying the bank turmoil could be a source for slowing uh, the economy. So uh, this question around that as well. Let's take a look right now at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell. Here is our own Abigail Doodle. Abigail, Abby. Well, Lisa, let's take a look at the shares of Disney because they are weighing on the major indexes down about 7% at this point, or excuse me, 6%, the worst day of the year. This, of course, is their second quarter Disney Plus subscriber miss weighs they're also talking about the idea that the loss for streaming in this current quarter will be about 100 million wider uh, than expected due to marketing costs. Investors not liking that. They wanted uh, something more. Relative to JD.com, those shares are popping higher. Sandy Zhu, the finance chief, is to become the new CEO. Analysts say this could mean a strong strategy change to help against competition. Microsoft down half a percent. The U.K. has continued to freeze that deal with Activision. And yesterday, speaking of freezing, Microsoft has announced that they are freezing salaries due to uncertainty. Alphabet, on the other hand, up 2.6 percent. AI advancements have the stock up. New hardware as well at the annual developers conference uh, as it was revealed. And then finally, Lisa, PacWest plunging, as you know, down 23 percent. This on the news that deposits fell 9.5 last week on talks of a potential takeover. That stock down with that trend. And I should mention, we also just had some breaking news on Peloton. Those shares uh, plunging down 7 percent as the Consumer Product Safety Commission has recalled 2 million exercise bikes due to fall and injury hazards. Abby, thank you so much. Coming up, Jamie Dimon giving the regionals a bit of confidence. The regional banks, who I've been speaking to like every day for the last week, they're quite strong. You know, they're quite worried because of the you know, run on deposits. Like that, but their financial results are good. Yeah. Their financial results are going to be good, OK, next quarter. But looking at the market, sentiment seems to be moving ahead, a different direction. That conversation is still ahead.
the regional banks, who I've been speaking to like every day for the last week, they're quite strong. You know, they're quite worried because of the you know run on deposits like that, but their financial results are good. Yeah. Their financial results are gonna be good, okay, next quarter. You know, they're earning money, they got a very good clientele, very diversified, uh, uh, and they're they're quite but strong. If you look at the detail, the SEC has the enforcement capability to look at what people are doing by name in in options, derivatives, short sales, and they should go, if someone's doing anything wrong, people are in collusion, or people are going short and then making a tweet you know, about a bank, they should go after them, and, and, and vigorously. That was JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon in an exclusive conversation with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. Meanwhile, PacWest coming back under pressure and dragging the regionals down with it. The bank revealing deposits dropped nearly 10% last week. In just one week, fueling the flight flight was a Bloomberg report confirmed by the lender detailing talks with potential investors. In a regulatory filing this morning, the company said, quote, the news headlines increased our customers' fears of the safety of their deposits. For more, Bloomberg's Shanali Basik joins us here in New York. Shanali, what's new and what's uh, causing all the concern? Now, listen, a couple of days ago here, when we thought about PacWest, it was the fundamentals that weren't a problem. It was really the market that was the problem, the sentiment around the regional banks. But now we have an instance in which the market is creating fundamental problems, in which you're seeing deposit flight from the likes of PacWest. Now, they have a lot of cash on hand, and from the regulators, uh, regulators' perspective, as well as other bankers, the idea here is that they have enough on hand to really make it through the storm, even with some deposit flight. But should that number keep getting worse that's where you have further future concerns and there's this whole other concern about their cost of funding and how much they have borrowed from the Fed now Western Alliance conversely has said deposits are up after PacWest has reported a drop so now we are getting to the point where we're parsing the regional banking system bit by bit you heard Jamie Dimon he said he has been on the phone constantly for the past week with regional bank CEOs that shows you we are not yet out of the woods but we are not at the point here yet of a potential potential cliffs facing these banks. And the implications of that, Shanali, will be discussed for weeks and months to, to come. Lindsay Rosner and Zach Griffith still with us to discuss just some of those issues. Zach, from your vantage point, how much are you still looking at regional banks as an opportunity point versus the other uh, sort of less optimistic prospect of an area of hurt for a while longer? Lisa, we really see it as an opportunity, and we've been in that camp for a while now. So when we think about the fundamentals underlying these banks, they're, they're very strong. You've had a few banks go under that had very idiosyncratic and clear issues with their customer concentration, with the quality of their deposits. And we've learned a lot about how quickly deposits can move in this technology, in the era of technology that we're in. And so that's certainly a concern. And really, when we think about what we're dealing with now, it's a crisis of confidence. That's something that we've been saying for a while. We think that once we can get some, I guess, break from the volatility, break from the, the headlines and the focus on this, whether it be a short selling pressure, pressure on the, the equities, we think that when we look at at least credit, bonds right now are, are going to have a lot of opportunity for spread compression from here. Lindsay, from your perspective, do you agree? I, I, we feel differently on this. Um, there is no need right now to have to invest in regional banks. Just because something widens doesn't mean you need to buy it. Um, back to the idea of bifurcation, really parsing apart who are the winners and who are the losers in this context. Um, I'll, I'll throw out a phrase of super regional. Um, there are some bigger players that we think will do well and have been thrown out baby with the bathwater that we are looking at adding to. But just because regional banks writ large are wider is not something that we're running to. There are a ton of opportunities right now in the fixed income market. Um, we've talked before about agency mortgage-backed securities, for example, where you can get a lot of spread and have the safety. So we don't feel that we need to go to this spot um, in investment grade. And I think there's just there's so much um, so much desire to jump into things that are widening. For example, there are a lot of people pounding the table about T-bills around the X state. You've got 100 basis points extra of spread. Go buy it. There's no reason to do these kind of things where there are there is an abundance of opportunity elsewhere. Um, and we have the ability to kind of look at that whole landscape and find those opportunities. And we're finding them. Zach, what's your thought on that, basically, this idea that spread widening isn't a buy signal at this point? Well, I'd say, at least on the T-bill front, I think that no matter what, you're going to get paid back by the U.S. government. So that seems like a decent opportunity to me. I think Lindsay's point that credit selection 
within the regional banks is very important. And we do have a few names that we like and a few that we don't. Fifth Third is one of our, our top picks. We like Huntington Bank shares from here. And so I, I do think that her point around credit selection is important. And I would say that broadly, even within our overweight recommendations, you're gonna to have to, to pick your spots here. But in, front, in, in general, we see the spread widening as, as an opportunity if, if you wanna take a look at it from an, an index level perspective. Lindsay, from your vantage point, would you say it's a crisis? Would you say that this is sort of another shoe to drop on a long sh uh, list of shoes uh, that are sort of cascading as we hit something that isn't a soft landing, or, or would you describe it differently? Um, Lisa, I'll go out on a limb and say that you and I are probably the expert on shoes in this threesome <laughs> conversation. Fair. Um, but yes, this is another shoe to drop. Will there be more? Um, it's, I, we're hoping that we're at the end. I mean, the, the banks that I think are troubled right now are banks that we were aware of in the apex of this crisis flare, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the termino terminology around it is difficult. I don't know that we, we have the proper lexicon at this point to uh, determine what to say here. But what I think is clearly a crisis is the crisis of confidence. That is a real thing that your average American does not know where to put their money, whether that is at a bank they're concerned about in the T-bill market because what's going on with the debt ceiling, that is a crisis, that is real. Um, whether we call a, a, a few banks, but obviously large asset amount going under a full-fledged banking crisis, I'm not sure, I'll leave that to the historians and the economists, but I definitely think the crisis of confidence is something true that we need to talk about. Lindsay Rosner, Zach Griffiths, both of you, thank you so much for being with us today. And coming up, the morning calls later, a brace for a new bull market. That's the view from TPW's Jay Pulaski. Expecting stocks to break up and out from here. We'll catch up with him around the opening bell. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Time now for our morning calls. We'll look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Piper Sandler downgrading Mosaic to neutral, pointing to bearish crop data that could hit sentiment on fertilizer stocks. Credit Suisse next, upgrading Alcoa to outperform, naming it as a top pick. And finally, Goldman Sachs downgrading Twilio to neutral. Coming up, we'll get the markets open. This is Bloomberg. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading, losing steam heading into that open. The SP futures near session lows uh, down almost three tenths of a percent. You could see uh, NASDAQ holding on to a little bit of a game, but losing it. And the Russell really losing more steam simply because what we have seen is in the bond market, yields lower, and you could see a softer tone more broadly. New York crude a lower, almost getting close to that $70 threshold, $71. And 50 cents, and that 10 year yield 3.36%. A little bit of Dallas strength, Euro weakness 109.18. One stock to watch at the open is Disney. Shares slipping at its streaming service lost subscribers for the second straight quarter. The C suite warning of more losses to come. Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle back with us for more. Hey, Lisa. Well, you know, it's interesting because the subscriber miss, that has everything to do with the fact that the company, or most likely has everything to do with the fact that the company raised prices last December to $11 uh, for uh, a month of streaming. And Bob Iger, the CEO, said that they're planning on raising prices again. But what has the stock down in addition to that subscriber miss is that while the quarter that they just reported, the second quarter, it was a strong quarter. It was in line with numbers outside of that uh, streaming miss. Uh, they narrowed the loss for streaming, but now they're expected to tack on another $100 million in terms of the loss, so it's expected to go wider. They're saying it's a blip because of marketing, but when you put all of this together, uh, that investors clearly not liking the result right now, it's also interesting in the fact that over the last uh, couple of years, this stock down uh, in a big, big way. This year it's higher, but kind of caught in a range. When you compare it to Netflix, on the other hand, Netflix is uh, more than a double uh, over the last year. So, so Disney investors 
investors really want to see them work these issues out, hope that the return of CEO Bob Iger can maybe do it. Maybe they wanted more fireworks in terms of color commentary. They didn't get it, so they're focused a little bit on some of these blips, according to the company, around streaming. Worst day since November 2022, if it holds. Abigail, thank you so much. Another earnings story. JD.com shares rising after reporting better-than-expected results and announcing changes in its C-suite. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld joining us now for more. Katie. Definitely a surprise move. So this shuffle comes just a year after the outgoing CEO took the job. And it also follows JD.com's slowest pace of growth on record. The Chinese internet retailer actually beat projections. Revenue grew by just 1.4 percent. So a beat, but not big enough. Remember, this company was putting up double digit growth numbers just a couple of years ago, of course, before Beijing clamped down on tech and internet companies. So this personnel change elevating the current CFO to CEO, analysts are saying that this suggests that JD.com is really shifting its focus to profitability. And you can see that shareholders seem to be welcoming that news ADRs of about 6% at this moment. Katie Greifeld, thank you so much. And speaking of tech, there is no day they can go by without a discussion about artificial intelligence. Google asserting its dominance in the AI market, unveiling its latest tools and shedding shares higher. The CEO is saying the magic words, quote, we're at an inflection point. We have an opportunity to make AI, ding, 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 even more helpful for people, for businesses, for communities, for everyone. Joining us now is Kaylee Lines. Uh, Kaylee, is this basically just saying the magic word and then shares pop? Yeah, maybe, Lisa, because you did see the stock gaining 4% yesterday on the day of the developers' conference and up again another 3% this morning. If there is anything we have learned in 2023, it's that investors really get excited when AI is mentioned. So Google is doing this rollout of generative uh, large language models uh, in its search engine. I would note, though, that it's doing it quite slowly. This update is only going to exist in Search Labs, which is a new experimental space that users actually have to sign up on a wait list for. So they aren't rolling it out broadly, unlike, for example, Microsoft Bing, which has uh, done so much more quickly. We have to keep in mind, though, what Google stands in theory to lose. Bing has a very, very small slice of the search market, whereas Google is dominant. It is literally a verb. So perhaps there's a little bit of hedging here. All that said, analysts today seem pretty positive on the speed at which um, Alphabet and Google are doing this. Morgan Stanley saying they're doing so faster than expected. KeyBank saying the event showed the company is moving swiftly. And also separately from that, AI is probably what is getting investors actually really excited. But they also introduced a foldable smartphone, which makes me kind of nostalgic for my flip phone, Lisa. <laughs> Kaylee, we'll let you be nostalgic. Thank you so much. Let's go over to the, one of the more important stories of today, frankly, which is the regionals. The sell-off has resumed in the PacWest shares, with the bank saying that its deposits declined, declined by nearly 10% last week. Joining us now is Bloomberg Shanali Basic. Uh, Shanali, how significant is this sort of decline in such a short period of time? It's significant because we know that this sector is already treading on ice. PacWest shares the brunt of those concerns. Lisa, when you take a look at it into this morning, it was trading at about 26% of its book value. When you look at that compared to the worst performers in the KBW Bank Index, those banks, even the worst performers, are trading at almost 60% or more of its book value. Still under book value, but a significant discount when you look at PacWest, and you see those fears reflected in how their bonds are trading as well. Now, PacWest this morning has been paused due to volatility, but they have been down pretty significantly, almost 29%. Western Alliance, which came out with its own statement on Thursday morning, saying that its deposits are actually up, uh, it is still also down uh, in early trading about 5%. So you can see these fears persisting even for banks that are showing you that they are bringing deposits in or holding deposits stable at this time. Just can't get the shares to balance. And you can see that in the KBW index as well. Shanani Basak, thank you so much. JP Morgan's CEO, Jamie Dimon, laying out how markets move forward from here. We need to finish the bank crisis. We've had uncertain policy on mergers, this first horizon deal. I think we have to assume there'll be a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know, whatever the FDIC, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, you know, whatever they need to do to, to uh, make it better, they should do. Be thoughtful, be very forward-looking, you know, not be surprised constantly, because some of these things have been known about for quite a while. The first order of affairs was simply getting through the crisis. TPW's Jay Pulaski joining us now. Jay, what do you make of that? Do you think that it is really seeming to be a cascading sequence of events in the regionals, or is it something more benign? Um, we're in the more benign camp, Lisa. Uh, we wrote about this in a piece called Firebreak uh, when SVB first failed, that we actually think this is a net positive in that 
it really takes the Fed off the table and prevents the Fed from over tightening and really damaging the real economy. And as long as this is kind of maintained or contained, let's say, in the regional banks, uh, we think that's going to be uh, okay for the overall economy. And we look at things like the impact on credit, for example, because really the concern is that we get into a credit crunch, right? But we look at the spread of high yield over Fed funds, and right now it's about 200 basis points. And when you typically have a systemic crisis or systemic risk, that spread blows out to four to 500 basis points. You look at the VIX, for example. The VIX is at 16, showing no signs of uh, concern. You look at the move index for U.S. Treasuries, 125 today, no sign of real concern. So I think the market has correctly assessed that this is an issue for some banks, clearly. Um, and we really think it's uh, an addition to what we call the curtain of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, that's really masking some major positives that we see unfolding in the U.S. and around the world. Okay, there's a lot there to unpack. And I want to start in the idea that the banking turmoil takes the Fed out of the equation. Earlier today, uh, Neil Kashkari of Minneapolis was speaking at an event at Marquette, Michigan, and basically saying inflation is still too high. And this is what a lot of people are saying after yesterday's CPI report. What makes you think, especially if we see the calm ongoing in the banking system, it will be enough to really change an equation for a Fed still trained on inflation running above 5% on a core level? Yes, I think that's an excellent question, Lisa. And we've been talking about a middle path between high inflation and recession. That's really been our kind of uh, guideline or direction for the past year. And we think we're moving in that direction. We expect the next several months to be very benign inflation prints. The year-over-year -year comps are very compelling. Inflation a year ago in May and June was roughly 1%. We think it's going to be about 0.4 percent for May and June of this year. That brings the headline number down to well under 4 percent by June. Uh, we think the Fed, the market is correctly assessing the Fed is not going to move in June. And we expect the Fed to actually raise its um, economic growth outlook when it updates its, uh, its inflation and growth estimates in, in June. And we think those could be some of the positive catalysts uh, that we're looking for to help the stock market break out and up from what's been a very long, uh, historically very long trading range. So from the SLUs to the SEP, the Statement of Economic Projections that we get, I believe on June 14th when the Fed does come out. One thing that you've been positive about, Jay, that you were talking about with respect to these shoots that are revealing themselves has been China. And you've been uh, pushing back against some of the people that have been removing from that nation, saying that's an opportunity. However, we did get data overnight about credit contracting. Are you still as optimistic or do you think that that trade has basically been played out? No, that's, again, a good question. I mean, China's been a disappointment from a stock market performance, for sure. It had that big run after they uh, removed zero COVID in uh, late 22, um, and stocks popped significantly. And they've given a lot of that back, even though growth estimates have been revised up considerably, and most people are now at 6% uh, growth for China for 2023. And it really reinforces our view, uh, Lisa, that we're early cycle not late cycle in a global economic recovery. And when you look at things that have been dragging down growth, for example, uh, housing or um, inventory destocking in the U.S., uh, those things are shifting to be growth additive in the second half of the year. And stocks are telling you that, right? When we look at our global multi-asset model, the two best performing positions over the last month have been transports and home builders. So while China's been a disappointment itself, and it's been a disappointment, it's kind of impacted commodities as well, we think globally we're in the early stages of a global economic recovery, not late cycle going into a global recession. Going forward, what is sort of the threshold that you look for to understand whether the economy is keeping pace with your expectations? And I ask this because the data is so noisy and people are coming up with different stories to define the data points that we get. What's sort of defining for you? Yeah, no, again, 100 percent right. Uh, I mean, Stan Drunkenmiller, one of the greatest investors of the modern age, said it's the most confusing period of his career. So, you know, who are we to argue, right? And I think a lot of that is this curtain of FUD. 
and the latest iteration of that is, um, is the regional bank crisis. We're focused on four major global policy changes that we see unfolding um, on a regular basis. The first is developed market central banks accepting a high nominal growth world by shifting their inflation target from 2%, say, to 3%. That's key. The second is the return of industrial policy to the U.S. and its expansion in Europe. One of the reasons why people are confused, Lisa, is that we haven't had industrial policy like the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, all of which are starting to funnel into the economy. We haven't had it in the U.S. in 70 years. So no investor today has any real grasp of how that impacts yeah. economic growth. The third is the end of yield curve control in Japan. We think that's going to be huge, and we think Japan is exiting structural deflation, going to lead to a big asset allocation shift within Japan, yeah. two stocks. Japan is breaking out. Check out EWJ, just breaking out, new 52-week high. And then the last is, is China-related in, in the shift to domestic demand away from fixed asset investing and um, export-driven growth, and that's... <laughs> That's huge for China. Jay, we'll dig into some of that in just a minute. Jay Pulaski is sticking with us, and we are going to turn our eyes toward everybody's favorite topic, which is the debt ceiling debate and what's going on with policy, as Jay was talking about. Secretary Yellen out with another warning for lawmakers. A default is frankly unthinkable. Um, America should never default. It would be tremendously economically and financially damaging. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, former Bank of England member Michael Sonder. That conversation at 11 a.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. A default on U.S. obligations would produce an economic and financial catastrophe. Millions of Americans could lose their jobs. Household incomes would be reduced. American businesses would see credit markets deteriorate. And millions of American families that receive government payments would likely be left without the resources that they were promised. Secretary Yellen doubling down on her grim message for Congress. The debate coming to a head as President Biden and congressional leaders prepare for yet another round of negotiations. The president taking his appeal on the road and throwing some punches. Republican threats are dangerous and they make no sense. If we default on our debt, the whole world is in trouble. This is a manufactured crisis. There's no question about America's ability to pay its bills. This coming as former President Donald Trump tells Republicans to hang tight, even if it means default. I say to the Republicans out there, congressmen, senators, if they don't give you massive cuts, you're going to have to do a default. And I don't believe they're going to do a default because I think the Democrats will absolutely cave because you don't want to have that happen. For more, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons joining us from Capitol Hill. Kaylee. Well, Lisa, the former president may be giving some sitting congressional members of Congress cover to take this to the brink or beyond. And I have had conversations in recent days with several Democratic members, including Representative Jerry Connolly, as well as Don Beyer, who both indicated to me that they do think there are members of the House of Representatives who would be willing to let the country default. And for that reason, they are more concerned in this debt ceiling uh, crisis than they have been in any before. All of that said, though, it doesn't seem like it has led to much of a strategy shift on either side. Both parties still pretty much towing the party line, sticking to the talking points. Democrats are willing to negotiate over spending cuts in the appropriations budget process, whereas House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and his caucus would like to see spending cuts as a condition for raising the debt ceiling, as was done in the bill that they were able to pass uh, several weeks ago. All that said, there does seem to be some sign of forward progress. Yesterday, aides from the White House and congressional leaders did meet. They will do so again today to talk about what spending cuts 
could be on the table. Again, though, it is unclear that they think they are talking about the same thing, whether those spending cuts are part of a debt ceiling package or a budgetary one. But of course, this is trying to lay the groundwork, find some common ground ahead of that meeting taking place tomorrow again with the big four, McCarthy, Schumer, McConnell, uh, and Jeffries uh, taking place at the White House with President Biden, who, of course, hasn't just been sitting by in the Oval Office waiting for that meeting. As you said, Lisa, he took this message on the road into swing territory yesterday, trying to lay on some pressure as the clock is ticking rapidly toward that, toward that theoretical June 1st deadline. Kaylee, thank you so much for that. TPW's Jay Pulaski back with us. Jay, how prepared are you for the U.S. doing a default? Uh, not very, uh, Lisa. I think it's highly unlikely that it's going to happen. And kind of the threat that it's likely to happen uh, would be, I think, probably one of the last and best buying opportunities for that uh, market break up and out uh, that we expect. And one of the reasons why uh, one, I don't think, has to prepare significantly in terms of rapidly adjusting their portfolios is because bonds are already priced for recession and stocks are positioned for uh, recession. You look at sentiment, you look at cash, you look at people, number of people, overweight equities, whether it's retail or institutional. You know, we are um, at almost generational lows in terms of investor sentiment. And that's one of the reasons why I think notwithstanding the headlines on this day after day after day, stocks are perfectly fine. Volatility indices, like we talked about, perfectly fine. Um, and so I think the market is sniffing out an economic recovery, earnings estimates going up, corporate guidance going up. Hold on a second, Jay. It's a forward yeah. discounting looking mechanism, and that's what it's focused on. I want to really parse out what you just said. You said that sentiment was already so depressed, and so that's why equities aren't really responding. They're looking toward a recovery. Are you saying that a default is all but priced in, that if we get close to that, there won't be some sort of reaction? No. Um, if a default actually occurs, then yes, there will be a reaction. It probably would be a uh, buying opportunity. Um, the threat of a default, if it leads to a 3% pullback, a 5% pullback in the S&P, would be an, a buying opportunity. Because let's, let's face it, uh, even if there were to be some sort of technical default, um, the likelihood of it being resolved uh, imminently, I think, would be very high. In the history of how markets react, particularly today, where so much is quantitatively driven, is that as soon as you have that peak fear, uh, the market prices it in and moves forward. And we saw that uh, with COVID, and we've seen that multiple times over the last couple of years with whatever the crisis of the day uh, is. Um, and so that would be how I would think about it. It's extremely unlikely to happen if the market weakens in anticipation of that. That's probably your last best buying opportunity for what's going to be a second half that's going to have better growth, Wait. higher earnings than most Hold on expect. A second. Jay, I know that you're bullish. I'm just wondering, is there anything that could make you bearish at this point that you could see in the data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we watch earnings very carefully. If the earnings estimates were being cut as opposed to being raised, we pay attention to forward corporate guidance which we just got with the second uh, with the earnings for Q1. If that were to be super, if that were to be negative, uh, that would be a real warning sign for us. Uh, in fact, it's been very positive, the best, the most positive in a couple of years. So yes, there obviously are things that if we were to see, we'd be worried about and think about repositioning. And we are overweight non-US equity, at least as you know, and have been uh, for over a year. Uh, Europe is breaking out, Japan is breaking out, Mexico is breaking out. There are breakouts happening all around the world. And so the opportunity set, I would agree with you, is uh, not necessarily in the U.S. It's outside the U.S. And that's certainly how we're positioned. And a lot of people agree with you. And it has been a really good trade. Jay Pulaski, thank you so much for being with us. It's always fun. I always appreciate your insights. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg.
35 minutes into the trading session and it has gone lower decidedly. So even the Nasdaq's joined some of the sockiness down about a tenth of a percent. The S&P uh, currently 17, uh, we could see, excuse me, 41, uh, 12, and we could see that down about six tenths of a percent. Let's take a look at bonds. You can see those yields are also falling lower. Time now to see the trading, trading diary. What you need to be watching through the next week. Fed speak continuing Friday with Daily Bullard and Jefferson all on deck. Plus, we'll get the UMish Consumer Sentiment Survey down in D.C. President Biden and congressional leaders resuming debt limit talks. Looking ahead to next week, the Senate Banking Committee holding its hearing on SVP on Tuesday and Tesla kicking off its annual shareholder meeting. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.